good evening ladies and gentlemen i thank kamini madam and uh, dr divisri and dr chaitra for giving me this opportunity safety and efficacy of superovulation in mild to moderate endometriosis what a terrible way of starting a presentation i hope things get better from this if you're looking at reasons for infertility in endometriosis there are millions of reasons like implantation failure ovulatory defects tubal defects immune dysfunction which basically means that we actually don't know what is exactly wrong if you look at this study it's actually us trends and outcomes from 2000 to 2011 it came last year they have compared ivf in 1 lakh plus patients with endometriosis versus 3 lakh plus patients with male factor infertility and they have found comparable results which means that you're looking at a patient with good oocytes and a good uterus then why do we talk about infertility in these patients in the clinic 40% of our patients have endometriosis of whom 40% will come to you with an endometrioma so when you see an endometrioma we think that okay this person may be having scv endometriosis there may be frozen pelvis the ovary and the tube may be stuck behind the uterus so what proportion of our patients actually have severe disease if a patient has no symptoms or signs whatsoever on laparoscopy the chances of finding a severe disease is very low only 30% of your patients will have minimal and mild disease but if the patient has symptoms and signs on laparoscopy almost 30% of your patients will have a severe disease 30% moderate disease remaining mild and minimal disease so If you see an endometrioma <coughs> it is more on the left side it can be bilateral in 30 percentage of patients and if you see kissing ovaries you may be looking at somebody with a 90 percent chance of having a severe disease absence of sliding sign between the uterus and adnexa is also an indicator of severe disease so will an endometrioma affect the fertility she has it what's the effect no endometrioma does not reduce amh it gives the same number of oocytes as unaffected ovary and patients who have been monitored have they have found that they conceive equally from the healthy ovary and the endometrioma ovary so endometrioma per se doesn't reduce fertility so what about the stage If you have a severe disease is your chance of having conception low if you have a mild disease do you conceive easily This is a fabulous chart which changed my viewpoint regarding stage and fertility in the x axis you can see time to pregnancy and in the y axis cumulative pregnancy in the graph you see four lines which completely overlap each other you cannot make make out which is mild and which is severe which means that your staging system is not a good predictor of pregnancy rate so what's good that's when adamson and pasta came in 2010 with endometriosis fertility index it measures the post op functionality of the reproductive organs which means they are looking into the functionality of tube fimbria and ovary on both sides individually and they have taken into consideration the historical factors like age less than 35 years of parity and duration of infertility of less than 3 years they have also added extensiveness or the scoring system to it now this is how they have charted just look at the top part where they are talking about functionality of tube ovary and fimbria if it is a very well functioning organ the score goes up if one of the organs is not functioning properly the score goes down they go for the least function in both sides now when we plot it 
somebody who has a very good EFI, which means somebody who has a very good functional adnexa, has a high rate of pregnancy, a high chance of conceiving. Whereas if somebody has a low functional score, the chance of conception is low. Which means that the functionality of the adnexa is of prime importance if you're planning for pregnancy in an endometriosis patient. So where will you do your surgeries? <coughs> Sorry. In severe pain. If you suspect malignancy, the chance is less than one percentage. And if, you, if the patient has pain on induction. So what happens to the ovarian reserve if you're doing a surgery for a patient? Even if you have a very good surgeon, there's a 25 percentage fall in AMF if AMH if you do a unilateral surgery. If you're doing a second surgery, it's almost a 60 percent drop. If you're doing a bilateral surgery, again there is a 60 percent drop. Even if you're a good surgeon, 10 percentage of your patients will end up with a low AMH, and 2 percentage may end up with premature ovarian failure. Hydrosalpings. If you see fluid collection in the tubes, it is wiser to remove the tubes because the tube has an alkaline medium which keeps trickling into the uterine content and hampering implantation even from the other side. So if you see hydrosalpings remove the tube, she may even conceive naturally from the other side. So if you are talking about superovulation, which means you are trying to bring two to three oocytes, how does it help? the theories. The increased number of oocytes available improves the chances of fertilization. The increased steroid production improves the chances of implantation. It may correct unsuspected ovulatory dysfunction and luteal phase defect and of course better timing. If you're doing superovulation after a surgery, if you're talking about stage one, stage two, if you're doing an expectant management, your chance is only two percentage, so better give medicines. And as you increase the dose of your medication, you can give clomiphene. If it doesn't work, you can take up the gonadotrophins. You can increase the dose. The aim is to get two to three oocytes, and the chance of pregnancy actually goes up. So go for superovulation as soon as the surgery is over. If you put a gap, there is a good chance that you are actually reducing the risk, uh, reducing the fertility chances, and increasing the risk of recurrence. Now, if you have done surgery for stage one and two, only eight percentage is going to have a benefit. To put it in another way, if you have the habit of doing laparoscopies to find endometriosis in unexplained infertility patients who have no symptoms and signs, if you do laparoscopy for 40 patients, 30 percentage will have stage one, stage two disease, which comes as 12 patients. And if you have 12 patients with stage one, stage two disease, you will get one extra pregnancy, which means that 39 patients had to undergo an unnecessary procedure for one additional pregnancy. But when it comes to superovulation after surgery, in stage three, stage four disease, what you actually want is to make the adnexa as functional as possible. There are limitations, but this is the goal. The absolute benefit of surgery for stage 3, stage 4 is not clearly known, but it is supposed not to exceed 25% in 12 months if the tubes are patent. This has to be followed by superovulation if you have done a surgery. Everything comes at a price. Your multiple superovulations have a slightly higher chance of recurrence when you are comparing it with IVF. IVF has one episode of hyperestrogenism, whereas these multiple episodes actually uh, decrease the chance, uh, has a higher chance of recurrence. And of course, multiple pregnancy. If you add IUI to your treatment, you should tell the patient that the pregnancy chance per month is only less than 15 percentage. But if she has the tenacity to stick to you for six months, it can go up to 70 percentage of accumulative pregnancy rate. Multiple pregnancy rates is around 15 percentage. If your patient has adenomyosis along with that, she has a 30 percent lower chance of conception. 
So we have so much background information if we put it into one patient who is sitting in front of you. What about somebody with endometriosis and not planning for a pregnancy now? You can do an AMH. If it's a good value, you can put her on cyclical or continuous OCP. This reduces the recurrence by almost 90 percentage. And the second line drug, this is as good as any of the second line drugs like Dynagest and uh, Dynasol and Gestronon. This is very good. This is good enough. Once she wants to conceive, you can stop the medication. But if she has a bad AMH, ask her to go for an early pregnancy. Now, if she has endometriosis on scan, make sure that she doesn't try to rule out a severe disease by ruling out kissing ovaries, bilateral adherence uh, ovaries, and absent sliding sign. You check the AMH. If the AMH is good, see whether the tubes are open. If the tubes are open, you can try superovulation for six cycles with or without IUI. The intention is to get two to three oocytes. If in this cycle she brings out only one oocyte, make sure that you increase the dose in the next cycle. So your documentation is of prime importance. If that fails, she can go in for IVF. Now the AMH, if it is bad, she has to go in for IVF. But if the patient has endometriosis on scan and she comes to you with pain, severe pain, this is where you will take her up for a surgery. First surgery is the best surgery and hopefully the last surgery for her. So get it done with the best person around. If you see hydrosalpings, remove it. If you have, then you do an AMH value. If the AMH is bad after your surgery, please take her for IVF. If the AMH is good with functional adnexa at least on one side, you can take her up for six super ovulations with or without IUI with the intention of getting two to three oocytes. If it doesn't work, IVF is there. Now the fourth scenario is when somebody comes to you with a surgical report. When you see her, if you find hydrosalpings, this is an indication to go in again and remove the tube. If you cannot remove the tube, at least clip it. Do an AMH. If the AMH is bad, she has to go in for IVF. But if the AMH is good, with good functional adnexa, that is the importance of your discharge summary. Superovulation can be tried for six cycles with or without IUI. If that doesn't work, she has to go in for IVF. Luteal support is a, has a doubtful role in non-ART cycles, but there are papers which say that as you increase your gonadotrophin dose, it may come in handy. GNRH antagonists have no proven role. This study came just two months back in human reproduction. I want to take your attention to this. We are all fertility specialists. We see a small cohort of what actually happens in endometriosis. If we take nurses' health study reports of around 52,000 patients or nurses who were in this study, 3,537 had lab proven endometriosis. The inference of this was females with endometriosis have a two-fold risk of infertility, which means that if your risk is 20 percentage, the patient's risk is 40 percentage, which also means that there is a 60 percent chance that she may not even have a fertility issue. All she may need is a fertile husband. Of these women, 74 percentage of where, pa where Paris prior to the diagnosis of endometriosis. 83 percentage of these women were Paris by the age of 40. 15 percentage required clomiphene or gonadotrophin. And only 2 percentage required IVF. Ladies and gentlemen, they were nurses. So in endometriosis management in infertility, the need of the hour is rather a problem-oriented approach rather than a lesion-oriented approach. In endometriosis-related infertility, the axis or the crux of treatment is the functionality of the adnexa, higher age, prior surgery, and superficial regions are related to infertility. A previous pregnancy is actually a good indicator and an endometriosis per se is not a risk factor for infertility.
there is a good possibility that a properly chosen patient given the correct treatment will go home with a healthy child even if your diagnosis is endometriosis ladies and gentlemen thank you